Welcome to the Art of Skill podcast, episode four. As always, I'm your host, Rick Ellis. Today's guest is Mike Palladino. Mike is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and world champion competitor known for his extremely technical no-gi submission grappling game. Mike was named Best Leg Lock Specialist in Grappling Today by BJJ EU. He's also a talented coach with an impressive resume. Stay tuned. The Art of Skill podcast is brought to you by Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. If you're an athlete, you need to be paying attention to your electrolytes for optimum health, performance, and recovery. Element comes in a variety of great flavors. Each packet contains sodium, potassium, magnesium, and no sugar or artificial junk. Just add a packet of Element to your water bottle and you're good to go. We have an exclusive offer for fans of the Art of Skill podcast. Get a sample pack mailed to you for the price of shipping. For more information, visit drinkelement.com slash theartofskill. That's drinklmnt.com slash theartofskill. Stay salty, my friends. So Mike Palladino, you are one of the instructors here at Grappler's Retreat in Mendocino, and I... Uh, I told Vlad when I talked to him that for me it has been just a joy to be a student because when you're teaching every night, it's just, you're, it's about giving to your students what they need. It's not about what you need. And so for me, it's been phenomenal to just be a student this week. I knew a little bit about you from your competitions. Like I've, I've seen you compete. I knew you're a killer athlete. I knew you're very dynamic, very technical, just an amazing competitor I didn't know anything about you as an instructor I didn't know anything about you as a human being and I have to say on both those fronts I've been incredibly impressed you are a fantastic teacher thank you that your depth of knowledge is incredible and you're a, an amazing human being you just exude this passion for jujitsu and a passion for helping people get better uh, and so it's just been you ex you know was exceeding my expectations when I came. I knew nothing about you, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I, uh, I'm really honored to hear that. I, uh, you know, I've, I've been a teacher now for ten years. Yeah, and, and so yeah, you're a seasoned teacher, despite the fact that you're still pretty young. Yeah, I'm 32. I started teaching probably around 21, 22, and uh, I opened my own academy 23, 24, um, and I've, I've, you know, I've seen I've seen growth in myself as a teacher from just testing out different methods of instruction to to mistakes I've made and trying to learn from it. Just like jujitsu, you try not to make the same mistakes. You try to be, you know, uh, analytical in, in your approach to teaching the same way that I do jujitsu. And I realized that, you know, so many different types of lifestyles do jujitsu, so many different personalities and so many different people of all ages and varieties do jujitsu. And so I try to try to teach to, to, a way that everyone can can kind of get something you know and that's that's my goal i want people to leave at least if, if it's one small detail yeah. i it's it's made me do my job correctly yeah. if, if they could leave with with something well jujitsu is such a big art and it can be different things for different people and it is for you as a competitor it's it's one thing or as a teacher it's one thing but it can be other things and one of the things that's always impressive is someone who's a killer competitor being able to understand that that's not what a lot of people need. They need something entirely different from jujitsu. And just watching you roll, you let students tap you. There's no ego there. You simply give them the experience that they need at that moment. And so where did that maturity come from for you? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I realized that jujitsu has to be a pleasurable experience for people. I don't really think that you know, beating people up or beating on people is necessarily the only way to help people grow. I, I just don't subscribe to that mentality. I know that some people do, and, and it's like not a sink or swim environment. I think when I started jiu-jitsu, it was a sink or swim environment, and I was definitely guilty when I started jiu-jitsu for the first year or two of like thinking that every single match was a competition match, you know? Yeah. Didn't matter the shape, size, you know, anyone in front of me, it was like a competition. And uh, 
I don't know, I, I started to mature as I grew a little bit older and, and realized that like, hey, you know, there's there's different approaches to this and everyone's doing this for a different reason. And then I started to realize that um, people learn uh, in different ways. And I think that for a lot of people, feeling is one of the best ways to kind of grasp a skill. Yeah. And so there's a, a happy medium between like, playing dead when you roll with somebody or going way too hard. There's like yeah. this, I like to play in this middle ground where I don't just put my arm out for the taking, but I leave it out for a little bit. And if you don't pick up on it, I'm gonna pull it back in, but I hope you pick up on it and, and things of this nature. And then you start to build in that kind of muscle memory for people and, and yeah, it, it's, 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 it's worked out and it's, 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 I've seen it work and benefit people to the point where they've grown yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was something that my instructor Roy always did. He always allowed. He gave the students the experience commensurate with their with, with their level. And when you're newer at jujitsu, some guys they they didn't understand what was going on. They would be like, "Oh, I tapped that guy." Yeah, like, you exactly. Know, there's exactly like, yeah, absolutely. like sometimes they don't have the perspective yes. to understand. No, no, this is not what's. Yeah, e exactly. You know, and I think that's important too. And and. I, I'm very aware that sometimes you believe thinking that they've, you know, oh, that guy's got not that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, for me, it's like, whatever, man, you know, I, 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 I don't care. But I think other people do, you know, like uh, you can turn it on at times, turn it off at times yeah. and, and just put it into overdrive and hang out. And uh, yeah, but it's definitely true. You know, I, I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. So how is your game? So 32 is still pretty young. I'm a bit older than you. And every decade... It gets harder. It yeah. Gets, it gets tougher. You know, it's just the body doesn't move quite as well, and things hurt in a way that they didn't before. What What has changed for you? Because you're continuing to compete a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I train. I train every day, and I definitely comp compete a lot. Uh, I definitely noticed that I'm a whole lot more sore, which has put me in more tune with my body, um, and I I try to stay active. Like if I get injured, like. Uh, I recently injured my, my hamstring wrestling. So I took five, six days off of doing absolutely nothing. But when I train, I try to train around an injury. This way yeah. I can stay in motion. Because I feel like if I don't train, my whole body starts to get sore. So it's like, at least if I'm staying in motion, uh, I, I, I can I can stay warmed up and, and, and feel good. But as like, I, as a youngster, you don't really, your diet is not a concern, so you're not worried right. about inflammation because it's not really existent when you're 20, 21 years old. Um, you're not concerned with fatigue because you know you feel like you can run three marathons back to back. And as you start to grow older, you know, I'm 32, but I truly believe from, you know, 14, 15 years of jujitsu, I've, you know, worked my body pretty hard. And so now it's time when I train to like, maybe I'm only going to train twice this week. And even yeah. if I train twice this week, maybe I'm going to have one harder training session and one lighter training session. Yeah. Or if I'm going to train right five there. times this week, you know, I'll train hard once and slowly dial it back. And by the fifth training session, I'm like working my way out of, out of positions. Yeah. People I, are surprised when they find out how much I roll, but I don't go that hard. Uh, you know, I'll maybe one night when I'm feeling good one day a week, I feel pretty good and I can hammer pretty hard. But the rest, I'm just greasing the groove, just, yeah. just keeping the motor going. We had this uh, like competition training um, with one of my buddies. He's like a sister school to us affiliate. And he, he his name's Leonardo Delgado, and he has a gym. It's in uh, Mississippi now. And uh, when he was up in Brewster, New York, he used to come and train. He's such a great competitor, and he's a little bit older than me, a little bit wiser than me. And one day, he was sitting on the sideline, and he's not training that day, and he's like, man how the hell are you training today you yeah. know and i was like i don't know if you're watching i'm letting everyone get to a good position yeah. today i'm just focusing on escapes i don't you tap me 15 30 times i yeah. don't care you know today i'm focusing on escapes and i'm going to try to work my escapes today and, and taking that kind of mindset really gives you longevity and it also makes you better technically speaking yeah. because you're you're spending more time defending the back so when you go to another gym and you know some hot shot guy jumps on your back I'm not yeah. scared. You yeah. know, I can start to work my way out. And that's kind of the approach that I like to take is you have to have fun with jujitsu too. Yeah. You know, if, if, if jujitsu becomes like, you know, if jujitsu becomes a chore, like, oh, I have to go train today, it's probably not too good, yeah. you know? And so I, I like to have fun and I like to mess around and just, you know, do jujitsu with enthusiasm yeah. and not with 
you know, like, uh, you know, forced yeah, resistance. It can, to get it can on be train. playful. It doesn't have to be, you know, whatever. And um, you mentioned defensive positions. I do that a lot too. Like on days when I'm not feeling super energetic, I'll just play defense. I'll let let myself be in bad spots. I'll be on my back, and that's fine. And it gives yeah. you, you know, the ability to deal with smaller and smaller and smaller windows to escape those positions or to just become untappable because you're just present and you're fine in those positions. Yeah, you you start to get okay with being there instead of trying to spaz out of them. You're yeah. Like, All right, I'm I'm cool with this right now. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree to that. So, are you goal oriented in your personal training? Like I always tell my students, walk in with a goal every time you train. Like there should be something that you're trying to get better at when you roll. Like be thinking about that thing that you're trying to do. Do you do that? Most definitely. And I take it a little bit further, and I look at goals in like six to 10 week kind of periods. And then sometimes I will wind up enjoying the goal so much that I set that I do it for another six to 10 weeks. Yeah. I read a book in 2015 or 2016 that really kind of changed my perspective on learning anything. You know, if you want to be a better photographer, a better mm -hmm. guitarist, and obviously jujitsu is in my life. And it's called Peak by a guy named Dr. Anders Ericsson. And he was an expert on experts and he, talked about the difference between the three types of practice. You have naive practice, and this is where I feel the majority of people fall into play. Naive practice is just showing up and going through the motions, yeah. right? And a lot of people do this. And then you have purposeful practice. And this is like really good if you're practicing purposefully, uh, it's very beneficial. You're setting goals, you're analyzing your, your data and your results, how you did, and you're looking to improve, you're studying and looking to improve. And then deliberate practice is where you or I come in. We're the coaches. So we have our students practicing purposefully and we give them feedback and then they apply said feedback. And this, this is how I approach jujitsu from a learning perspective. And I really believe that it works. Uh, I, the proof is in the pudding in my opinion, just, you know, with people that I've helped coach and, 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 and with myself to develop, whether it's tournament oriented, like sports. oriented. so give me some, um, like a concrete example of how how you do sure. go about doing that. So uh, in like late 2017, early 2018, I started messing around with the Darsh choke. The Darsh choke I've known since white belt or blue belt. You know, uh, it's an arm choke, and and I always knew the Darsh choke. I could teach the Darsh choke, but I didn't know yeah. the Darsh choke. Yeah. I didn't know the ins and outs and the nuances and what if they react this way what if they react that way and so i set my goal i said for the next six to eight weeks i'm gonna study the dars and i went and did studies online i watched people that were good at the dars choke like jeff glover um or bill the grill cooper like guys from back in the day mm -hmm. a guy in the ufc right now that's great with it is uh vicente luque his whole gym so i wound up studying and i find out that his whole gym in brazil say how to mma they're all front headlockers you know mm -hmm. and so I, I i i start to 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 really immerse myself in studying people and, and gyms that are good at the position. I'll buy instructionals and I'll study. And then when I go to the gym and it's time for me to actually train, my goal for the next, you know, again, six to 10 weeks is to really focus on the dar stroke and hitting it from different positions. And it's not my only goal for the training session, right? Like, obviously if I'm in my guard, I'm not gonna give up the guard pass to, to you know, just to reset to try to go for dart. I'm gonna roll and I'll catch other things, but I'm, I have a hyper focus on going for the Dars choke. And then I'll roll with four or five people. And, you know, uh, two of the guys didn't even let me get to the Dars. Another two of the guys, I got to the Dars, yeah. but they were keeping their elbow tight. One guy I caught. And so I'll start to look back at like, okay, what do I do here? And maybe I'll, maybe I'll say, hey, let's stop the roll here and let me figure this out. And you start to get a feel for it. And now it's like, you know, when usually when I do seminars, um, People are like, hey, can you show us the Dars? You know, can you do a whole seminar on the Dars or the front headlock? Or in tournaments, you know, I had gone from never ever even trying to go for a Dars choke to hitting like, you know, 10 or 12 Dars chokes in back-to-back -back tournaments. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that's 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 kind of like a concrete example of deliberate practice, specifically with the Dars nice. that, That's a great example. Uh, how is competition prep different than just normal training? Yeah, I think, I think that competition uh is very much 
mindset oriented. I think there's a lot of people that are prepped for tournaments and then when it's when it's go time, like their 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 sports psyche starts to kick in where there's like now this outlet is totally different. Yeah. There's people watching, there's pressure and I I think that that is a really big aspect that I've had to learn as I as I rank up in jiu-jitsu and as I become more experienced and more advanced is taking that aspect out of it, the fear of losing, right? Everyone has this fear of losing and it's like losses where some of the biggest growths happen. If you watch historically speaking, yeah. fighters and grapplers and boxers, uh, a loss can really re transform somebody and make them great and so i remember when i first got my black belt like i set out this goal and i didn't complete the goal and it was called the road to 100 and i wanted to do 100 matches in a year and it's a completely obtainable goal yeah but i remember that i hadn't competed for like a whole year straight and i started to question i'm like why am i not competing and it wound up by the time I sat down and, and worked it out, I realized that I wasn't competing because my ego was getting in the way. And it was saying things like, what's your competitor business owner gonna do that's three miles away, five miles away, when he sees you lose? Is he gonna post it? And you start just making up yeah. these situations that you know aren't likely, that's not probably not gonna happen. Who cares if they post it at the end of the day? Or yeah. who cares if someone sees you lose? Or who cares if your students see you lose? You know, you're human. And, yeah. and the way to grow is to get out there. And you lose, you lose. But you win, it, it's a great feeling as well. And what winds up happening is when you're goal oriented in this aspect of competing what you'll start to see is soon if as long as you are consistent and consistently putting putting in the effort to get better you'll start to see results will get better as well and you compete more because it's more overall data for you to analyze and yeah. film for you to watch to see where your mistakes are oh i left my arm out here that's why he caught the kimura in that transition or i didn't have my chest tight when i was passing his guard he was able to get his frames in and his hips out and recover guard and all of these little things and i think that that's why competition is important and i think that's why you're yeah. able to start to uh develop through through competition and and probably one of the biggest carryovers of competing frequently is that it becomes mundane and therefore, it's not, you don't have the weight of the world on you. You don't get in your own head as yes. much. You're more calm. It, it feels just like another day of training because you're just doing it, yeah. right? There, there's like competition anxiety for sure. I've seen Very some, much so. I, I've, I've seen some really great people that don't even recognize how skilled they are and they're they're just terrified at yeah. the idea of competing or it's game day and they don't show up you know and i've also seen the flip side people that are not good in training but like they're mentally strong when it comes time yeah. for competition they just turn it on yeah. you know and uh, I, I i i really enjoy competing and i i, I just enjoy the evolution that jujitsu has taken over the last you know 20 years and, and and obviously you could even cut that in half and say the last 10 years it's yeah. just evolved to this incredible art and sport you know i'm a i'm i'm a fanatic of, of jiu-jitsu i, I I'm, yeah. I'm a fan I, I i have all the dvds you know i'm watching all these, these these guys compete and and i and i've been lucky enough to compete against some of these guys you know so do you a, push your students to compete so i my, my philosophy is always that if you don't want to compete don't compete but yeah. i think that Probably by at, at Blue Belt, you should probably hit a couple competitions just to have that experience. Whether yes. whether you go on to compete, it's compete. it's. Uh, I'm more in your ballpark. Uh, I always have the competitions up on the board, and I say, "Hey guys, we're gonna get out there and compete." And I try to organize like yeah. a a. I try to organize like, "Hey, you know, come out, you know, support and and and." Usually, if you can get people that are on the fence of competing to go to a tournament and to see how it is. Uh, then they'll the itch will be there to compete and then they'll they'll go to the next one uh i'm not like uh i don't i'm not super heavy on the push like everyone in my gym has to compete let's go if you want to get this blue belt you better be competing yeah. if you want to get this purple belt however i do try to steer people to compete i mean because there is so much growth in it again win or lose um it's 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 a growing experience competing and it's sad you know i've seen people compete you know once or twice and you know if they had competed 
four or five or six more times, yeah. they they would still be competing. However, they had a bad experience the first time. Yeah. They're like, I'm never competing again. I'm never, and it's a mindset thing. And then they go and they're like, all right, fine, I'm gonna do it one more time, I'm gonna give it one more try. And they compete a year or two years later, and then they, they, they lose again. And they don't realize how much they've progressed in that loss, they just view it as a loss and they don't compete again. And yeah. it's hard, people, I think, people need to compete to see that it's there's a there's a growing process in it aside from the mat there's this mental and psychological yeah. aspect to competing that like and there's just a higher level of intensity that you don't usually feel that in the home gym yeah and it can be shocking that first time you yes. feel that you're like whoa yeah I, I totally agree and this is it's so true that you say this you, you see this sometimes you see the guy in the gym that's like uh you know the big guy and he's not putting his weight on people because he doesn't want to be labeled like the dick grappler you right. know or like um and then they'll go and compete and they've built this habit in where they don't put weight on people you know and it's like all right we got to fix that you know now that said with certain students who have incredible physical potential Sometimes I will push those guys to compete for that next belt. I'll say, you know what? I want to see you do two competitions this year, three competitions. I'll give them a goal yeah. that involves that because, you know, they just don't get pushed as hard in the dojo because yeah. because they're just they're, very they're, good athletes. They're in the top tier. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. They're in that 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 higher tier within within the gym. Perhaps they have you know less responsibility uh perhaps they don't work as much right. you know and and they're able to to spend more time on the mat and develop at a more rapid race i think it, if i may go off on a little bit of a tangent here but i think that's one of the biggest changes in jiu-jitsu that i've personally noticed in the last you know 10 to 15 years is there wasn't a whole lot of gyms 15 years ago you know right. what i mean you had to travel to do jiu-jitsu and now gyms are much more frequent and and they're they're much more common you know like Maybe there used to be one gym in a 60 mile radius and now there's, you know, one, there, there's three gyms in a 10 mile radius, right. you know, there, your access to jujitsu is higher. Um, and with that said, the ability, like in my gym, I have class 5.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., 5 p.m., 6.30 yeah. p.m. So, you know, and there's all these opportunities for people to be able to come in and progress. Where back in the day, gyms were typically run by someone that had a full-time job, yeah. like law enforcement officer. He, he, he ran a job, he, he ran a gym on the side just to like, you know, get some extra training in, whatever the case is. And class was uh, Tuesday, Thursday, you know what I mean? Uh, something along these lines where they sublet space. And, and so the, the ability to develop at a much more rapid pace is higher now than, than it's than it's been in the past. Yeah, I think we're living in the golden age of jujitsu with YouTube and all the media out there and the availability of training. When I started, and this wasn't that long ago, it was 15, 16 years ago, you saw a purple belt, it was like seeing a black swan. Yes, yes, know? yes, absolutely. And you get guys, you know, Fira Sahabi, a lot of these guys, they were literally white belts or blue belts when they started teaching, yep. you know, and, yeah. and that's a hard journey. You have to, you're not only trying to become a good student yourself and learn this, but while you're doing that, you're trying to bring others up. Yeah. And, and so, the access to it, like you said, you know, like the access to it, you saw a purple belt back then, and it was like you would go to a seminar to get the forbidden knowledge. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like at the access of your fingertips, like, hey, let me reach out to this guy and, and see if he can come here and do this, you know, or send me somewhere where he learned how to do the dars or whatever the case yeah. is, you know. And, and the uh, flip side of that is I think people just go down too many rabbit holes and just information overload. Yes. Especially when you're new, when you're white belt, blue belt, the process of getting good is so mysterious. Like yeah. how, how do you get good at jujitsu? There's this Rubik's cube to solve and you don't even know. And sometimes your coaches don't even tell you how to get good at like, you just have to just keep showing yeah, exactly. up. Sink and, or swim. So, and so then you just start going down every rabbit hole and you start trying to assimilate all this stuff, but that doesn't necessarily always help you. Yep. It just becomes, it's overstimulation and it, and it winds up in my opinion, that's, like overstimulating and uh you wind up not getting good you wind up taking a longer time to get good you yeah. know if, if 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 you know what i mean like an example would be a martial artist who practices taekwondo on monday karate on tuesday wrestling yeah. on wednesday sambo on thursday bjj on friday and they 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 do all these different arts but you're really only progressing at that art one time a week. Yeah. You know, you're not progressing at that art. And it's the same thing when you're trying to develop. You you want, in my opinion, systematic learning is the best. Yeah. When you're a child, you typically learn 
uh, addition and subtraction together for a year, right. and then you'll learn multiplication and division together for a year, and you're 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 slowly adding to your systems of mathematics. You're building the foundation exactly. of the house before you build the walls. Exactly. Not adding a window on Monday, and then we're going to add a roof on Tuesday. You know, you're 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 building that foundation. And a lot of times when you're new at jujitsu, white belt, blue belt, you're just always looking for that sneaky technique that your yes, training partners yes, don't know. Yes, absolutely. You know? And they get it, right? Most of the time it's like that straight ankle lock. You got that white belt that figures out an ankle lock and it's like they become so reliant on this that they don't ever develop their, their sweeps. They don't develop the guard pass and they don't develop other areas of attack. And yeah, no, it's it's true. It's like a, it's like a dopamine hit. They get their, their one submission that they're good at and, and, and they're, they're missing out on opportunities and growth. And I feel like part of jujitsu is starting to be able to, you know, is starting to be able to recognize patterns for yourself. But again, that takes some time. Yeah. And it's hard. I remember being a white belt and, you know, I anything the instructor told me in regards to defensive jujitsu was like out the window. Yeah. I don't care. That stuff's silly. You know, I don't need to, I'm going to try, I'm going for the kill all the time. I don't need to learn how to defend my back because I'm going to, I'm going to come more of them before they could take my back, you know? And it's like this, this aspect where like a uh, defense is not as, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's not as appealing off the bat, right? What's appealing is that cool little leg lock. You just, there was did. a, I, I, I know a black belt, and I, I'm not going to say names, who said that at his academy, he doesn't teach much in the way of escapes because in his philosophy, you should never be in those positions in the first place. Terrible philosophy. Oh, I, I, <sighs> Terrible philosophy. Yeah. You know, I, 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 uh, this is another thing, uh, just going back to, to, you know, how I've changed, how I train and teach as I, as I age. Um, and we do very little rolling, maybe like, 25, 30% of the time in, in throughout a week, uh, we're rolling and we go live every practice, but it's always from dominant positions, you know? So we'll be in the mount. We'll start with, and you have to escape or reverse. We'll be on the back and you have to escape or submit. We'll be in closed guard. You have to pass or sweep submit. If you're on the bottom, take the back, you know? And it's like, what happens is, and the, the reason that I think this works so well is you start, it's like punching a clock when you go to work, yeah. you know, you, 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 you start to establish time in position of attack and defense. Let's say you have a gym, you're a black belt and you know, you're the head honcho at your gym and you're going against you. Most of your students are blue belts and purple belts perhaps. And no one's passing your guard, right? Unless you let them, but no one's passing your guard because you're rolling with your students competitively or whatever the case is. You don't wind up in bottom side control that much. So your hip escape is not that good. You don't wind up in bottom mount. So your escape from mount is not that good. And all of a sudden you go to competition and now you're going with someone, they just passed your guard. You can't do a friggin' thing to recover and you're yeah. trying to next yeah. thing you know, boom, you're mounted. And you've never felt mount like this because you haven't spent the time defending the mount, you know? Yeah. And so I, I'm a big, big proponent of situational drills for, for, for long periods of time. So you told a story the other day about your mom who was not real supportive of you doing this weird jujitsu thing, yeah. at least as a career. Yes, yep. And she came to a belt ceremony and she was moved to tears. Yeah. And so tell me about that. So uh, I went to alternative high school and outside of high school, I got a job right away. I started working construction and I was doing jujitsu and working construction and uh, setting the alarm clock every day to 5 a.m. I did it for like two years and uh, I was just miserable, you know? I was like super miserable waking up and like, I just, I wasn't happy with my life and where I was. And I knew that jujitsu made me, it didn't, made me so happy to do and to train and to work with people and to, to help them grow. And what was it about that? You I think, I, can I, you, can you put your finger on what I just, it is? I remember like doing some soul searching cause I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm don't come from a college educated family. You know, my parents, my, my, my father works down in the city. Like a lot of people, they're union yeah. workers. They travel down to the city. And so I thought that was my, I thought that was going to be my, my goal in life, you know, get, get a, a union job and be a civil servant. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I got a lot of love for my father. Um, but I, I, I didn't think that, uh, I definitely did not want to do that. And so I was working this job two or three years doing construction 
and I remember listening, like, I was reading self-help books, and I, I remember listening to Alan Watts, and he said, what, he had this lecture, what would you do if money was no object? You know, would you be a cowboy? Would you become a writer? Would you yeah. be a poet? What would you do? And I sat there, and I was like, man, I can do jujitsu. Yeah. You know, I can, I can, I love teaching it. I love competing. I love learning. Jujitsu's been this one thing that, like, Typically, I have ADHD. I'm all over the place, you know, and jujitsu was the one thing that like held my concentration and put me in this trance to to really work. And uh, when I decided to come forth and tell my parents like, hey, this is what I want to do, you know, they were uh, opposed to it, you know, like you need to grow up, you know, you're not, you, they were kind of viewing life from the social calendar. Like you have to, you have to have your shit together by this age. You have to start to get this serious job by this age and married by this age and have kids by this age and so on and so forth. And yeah. I think that like, you know, the idea that I wanted to do jujitsu and to them, they have no idea what jujitsu has done for my life. They have yeah. no idea how it's molded me and transformed me. And, uh, so when I told them that I wanted to do jujitsu, they were like, you know, you need to grow up enough with this karate shit. You know, yeah. you got to get a real <laughs> job. We're going to get you taking all the city tests. We're going to get you doing this. And I was like, I'm going to give this a try. I want to give this a try. And uh, I wound up, I wound up leaving my construction job. I sold my car. I got some money. I, I bought mats. I sold my video game systems and I sublet space from a karate school. And it slowly, slowly grew. And over time, you know, my parents started to see like, okay, he, this is this is growing. Someone went up to my mom in a tournament and was like, your son's really changed my life. And he was like 55, you know, and she was like, how can my 22 year old son have changed your life? You know, it, it, she wasn't, she was getting it, you know, yeah. and she was supportive of me. Um, and then last week we had promotions at my gym and my mom came. And I don't think that she had expected to see the magnitude of the jujitsu community and environment and be it in my culture at my gym and my community at my gym but i just feel that that's a microcosm for the bigger microcosm of jujitsu in the community and uh she was like absolutely blown away and it brought her to tears to see how like i can be in the front of a room and have such command over a room and i could be so yeah. friendly and humorous with all these different walks of life and uh, at the end of the at, at the end of the promotions she came up to me, she gave me a big hug and she started crying. And she was like, wow. you know, I'm so proud of you. I'm so sorry that I doubted you. And uh, yeah, you know, it was like- That's blew, powerful, it, Yeah, That's it, a powerful it, story. It, it, it blew me away. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like super, super happy that she was able to kind of see, you know, and- uh, You know, people don't see, like, if you're out of jujitsu, you're not, this is, this, it's such a strange subculture yeah. that we operate in. But yet, man, it has, the power to transform lives to get into people's souls in a way that if you're operating outside of that realm you don't it's so foreign and you can explain yeah. it yeah it, it's, it's what it's, is it about jujitsu i think it's suffering you know i think it's suffering with a bunch it's pure jujitsu is pure and you go through the suffering you go through the trials and triumphs and it's like you know, I, I, a lot of, I don't say a lot of people, but there's people that think like, you know, uh, like jujitsu, jujitsu, oh, like I hate the, the hippie spiritual jujitsu of, uh, aspect of jujitsu rather, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's fine if you don't like that. You know, you don't have to subscribe to that. No, you, no one's making you subscribe to that. But, you know, if, if jujitsu has changed your life, there's people out there it's completely changed their life and, 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 and helped them out and get them out of dark spots. But I really think jujitsu is relatable to life because you put in work and you have progress and you have setbacks and you don't quit. You know what yeah. I mean? You, you, you keep moving forward. You keep looking to progress. If you have a setback, realize setbacks are part of the journey. Setbacks, again, like speaking earlier, when you, when you lose a match, there's so much victory and loss because you can, you can take experience away from that and develop and grow and i feel that the the beautiful part of jujitsu and the community that it brings together and all the different walks of life is that we all know that suffering yeah. jujitsu is pure there's no lying on the mat you know and i think that is what makes it such an incredible art you know and you get to meet these people and it's like the last time i was here at the grapplers retreat i made like friends for a lifetime you know yeah. i was going out to arizona after the retreat I, a couple months back i went out to arizona to go hang out with some of the guys we met up we all flew in there and uh it's I, 
essentially these guys are strangers that I met on a one week retreat, but yeah. it's so much more than that. You know what I mean? It feels like way beyond that, you know, like the relationships grew from, from one week of training together at a camp to like, you, 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 you're, it's, it's, it's just an amazing experience. You, you, ha- you said the word struggle and I think you're absolutely right because in the real world out there, there isn't always a lot of struggle. I mean, you get a promotion, you maybe have to work a couple, you yeah. know, you have to work some long yeah. night. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not yeah. that yeah. hard. Exactly. Honestly, real life isn't always that hard. And we also live in a culture, the participation trophy culture. We live in a time where parents shield their kids from any kind of struggle. Yeah. Any kind of, you know, it's, if you, they even take the word lose out of the vocabulary. Everybody's a winner. Yes. And you walk into a jujitsu academy and it's a pure meritocracy. Yep. It's nothing but struggle. And there is failure over and over and over. I still fail. I'm sure you fail Absolutely. still. And um, yeah, that's powerful to have that because we don't have that in, in the real world very much. Yeah, and, and, and it's a sense of, it's a sense of, I guess you would say, like, uh, being genuine, Yeah. right? Like, there's no, I, I've, I personally feel that if you do jujitsu, you're typically fairly laid back outside of jujitsu, mm-hmm. right? Like, you don't go around looking for fights, you don't have anything right. to really prove, and it makes it easier to walk away from, you know, a situation, if you, whether it's in public or whatnot, uh, and... It's the ability that I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Yeah. But most people don't know what they don't know. Absolutely. They have this aspect in their mind of what they would do. It's the, it's the classic example of like the the meme of the, the guy from South Park on a couch eating fried chicken who's like, you know, massively obese saying like, oh, I would have done that if yeah. I was in there. <laughs> and it's like, you have no idea that you don't know that you don't know. You know, and that's jujitsu, you know, you, you, you go into a room and like you said, it's a, a meritocracy and yeah. And you can't always tell it's like, again, the guy sitting on the bar stool next to you who looks frail and broken down, he might've been a Muay Thai champion. Yes. You have no nope. idea and it makes you humble and it makes you, you know, more confident, but more humble. It's like a tempered, uh, confidence. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it really is. I think that, uh. I think that these experiences make people a, a better outside, right? Yeah. Like knowing that you, you're no longer as like, you're no longer like I can beat that guy up. You know, if, if you're that type of person. You're, I you're, remember almost getting into fights when I was young, just being cocky and being full of hubris and just feeling like, I mean, some dude spit on my car. Like there's just these experiences yeah. you have a, a little bit of road rage going on and I was like, I am lucky I didn't just get my ass handed to me because I had literally no skills whatsoever, like yeah. zero. Yeah, you see, you see some of these videos on YouTube, and and both people have well, they're, absolutely they're in their face, yeah. right? And you're <laughs> they have no skills. You know what I None. mean? And it's zero. like jujitsu is where we're, every day we're going at a hundred percent as far as resistance is concerned. You know, and it's like we've uh, we've we've really just punched that clock on the ability to train and deal with resistance and in many ways jujitsu teaches you how to deal with resistance and when by the time you go outside it's like i'm i don't do it cool you can beat me up yes okay yeah, yeah sure you know and uh yeah I, I think that's a pretty pretty cool aspect of jujitsu so what are your goals now in, in jujitsu just to keep growing your academy do you have goals uh beyond yeah. that or yeah you know i uh i definitely would like to continue to grow my academy i, I want to get back out there and competing my wife and i are, are uh, expecting our first child nice um in a couple of months now and i'm really excited for that challenge of life and uh hopefully i'm, I'm able to use some of the life lessons jujitsu has taught me and you know, becoming a better father, a better husband, and a, 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 a better individual, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Where do, where do you lurk online? Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Instagram. It's Mike Palladino BJJ. Um, I have a Facebook, but I'm on it like once every six months. Yeah. Um, my website is uh, evobjj.com, and my gym's in Beacon, New York, so it's about an hour outside of the city if you're ever in... Uh, New York. It's a one-hour train ride from Manhattan. It's a beautiful city in the Hudson Valley called uh, Beacon. Yeah. 
Well, Mike, I appreciate it, man. It's been so awesome to train with you. Likewise. And good conversation. Yeah, it's good. thank you. Like, again, I, you don't know what to expect when you meet someone you just know them oh he's that guy who's got that insanely fast guard passing and like super dynamic but you turned out to be a really Thank amazing you. human being I, I, I definitely appreciate that and um a beast on the mat thank you yeah you're, levels you're to this game. very very slick yourself yeah. you know <laughs> you, you're, you're you're one one tough guy and you got uh, an incredible game you know thank it's you. like how old are you i'm 57 57 years old and and you're out there Friggin' keeping me off a of side control of you with just impeccable technique mm -hmm. and efficiency. And yeah, you were you were a great training partner during this camp. It, it was a real pleasure training yeah. with you. Well, thank you, brother. You and I thank are brothers you. now. There's yeah, something absolutely. about that shared struggle. Yes. Man, you bump fists and you're best bros with someone. <laughs> yes, no doubt about it. So, shared look, suffering. Looking forward to training with you again. Yeah. And it's just been a phenomenal experience and we still have another day. So no, a couple day and a half. Yeah. So but we will do more. Thank you. Appreciate you. Alrighty. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.